Rising above the mist outside the modern city of Beijing, China, stands an ancient temple, a temple dedicated to the worship of an invisible and all-powerful god, Shangdi, the god of heaven. A masterpiece of architectural and landscape design, this magnificent structure serves as a mysterious reminder of a time when the spiritual heart of the Chinese nation was much different than it is today. A time when China was ruled not just by one emperor, but by one god. China, one of the most ancient and most mysterious nations on the face of the earth. Remnants from China's recorded history can be traced back to as early as 2000 BC. The earliest relics containing accounts of the Chinese written language were inscribed onto the backs of turtle shells, which were excavated from the ancient burial sites of the Yin Dynasty. These oracle bones, as they are called, contain a number of historical references the Shangdi, the ancient Chinese name for God, which literally means the emperor above. The writings depict a sophisticated culture in which the worship of God was a normal and regular part of the lives of those living during the Yin Dynasty. The oracles also refer to the existence of a formal and elaborate worship ceremony dedicated to offering sacrifices to the God of heaven which had been well established over 3,500 years ago. Evidence citing the worship of God in ancient China is also found in the Chinese literary masterpieces known as the Nine Classics. These cherished writings were handed down from generation to generation for over 2,000 years, chronicling a variety of teachings on religion, history, philosophy, and ethics. These ancient citizens worshipped a spiritual sovereign who was truly the emperor above. The most original and native belief started around the time of the Western Chao Dynasty, about 3,000 years ago. This belief we call Jitang, the worship or sacrifice to heaven. God's sovereignty and omnipotence means that there is nothing God cannot do. The ancient Chinese believed that everything that occurs naturally like life and death and sickness and health are created by God. The emperor of China recognized and submitted to this unseen celestial ruler. He realized that the prosperity and security of his empire was dependent on receiving favor from Shangdi, the god of heaven the mandate of heaven. This was the idea that the emperor was the son of heaven and ruled the world by divine authority. For this reason, the son of heaven was exclusively qualified to offer sacrifice to the supreme being on behalf of all the people. Early in ancient Chinese culture, only holy men were allowed to worship and offer sacrifices to God. 
These holy emperors govern the empire on behalf of the God of heaven. At the end of their reigns, they passed down their right to rule the throne of China to other holy men who were chosen on the basis of their holiness and dedication to God rather than passing down the throne to their own sons. After the first dynasty of Shia was established in 2033 BC, the right to govern the nation on behalf of God became the sole privilege of the emperor. During that age, not only the emperor, but also his officials thought the ceremony of offering to heaven was the most important thing, so that if they had not tried their best to carry out this ceremony, they would be punished by heaven. According to Confucius, a famous Asian philosopher in China, sacrifice to heaven was the most important thing for the country. From that time forth, the emperor was regarded as the son of the god of heaven, and therefore only he was allowed to worship and offer sacrifices to Shangdi on behalf of the people. Because his position represented the divine birthright to rule, each emperor throughout China's history regarded the worshiping of God as an act of accepting power and responsibility from heaven to govern the nation. What the emperor did on this day was not like what he would normally do, giving all sorts of commands to his people and country. But this time, it's like what his servant would do for him. He came to a being much mightier than himself, the invisible, untouchable, highest God to report on his work on earth and to pray for continual blessings. For thousands of years, no idol or any kind of physical image was ever made to depict the God of Heaven. The only exception to this was the Emperor Wu Yi, who in 1197 BC carved an idol from wood in order to mock it and to exalt himself over the King of Heaven. As an act of defiance, Wu Yi would have bags filled with pig's blood placed above the idol depicting Shang Di. He would shoot arrows at the bag while the sound of his taunting laughter would often echo throughout the palace yard, the blood spilling over the wooden carving. His mockery lasted only a few short years, however. During one of his hunting trips, a flashing bolt of lightning suddenly split through the open sky and furiously struck down the arrogant ruler, killing him instantly. This frightening turn of events also struck fear into the hearts of the Chinese people as they witnessed the wrath of God swiftly poured out against the defiant emperor. After his death, it was decreed that no image of the God of Heaven would be made or displayed in any imperial setting and that this supreme ruler of all creation should be revered only by calling on his name. There is an expression that came from the book Shang Shu, Fear God. Why should a person dare to disrespect God? Because God is omnipotent and perfectly faithful. The worship of God in China was resumed and continued for many years. For generations, the emperors of China continued to seek the favor and power of God to provide for and protect their great empires. The spiritual heritage of this act is a legacy that goes back to the very beginnings of Chinese culture. There have been a number of altars discovered throughout China which were used at one time to worship the God of Heaven. The altar at Taishan, for example, was used during the reign of the Emperor Chen, who built the Great Wall. The Han and Tang dynasties worshipped at another altar located in Xi'an. However, the most prominent and well-established altar used to worship and offer sacrifices to Shangdi was the Temple of Heaven, situated outside of Beijing. Built in 1530, this magnificent temple was remodeled and expanded in 1749. A total of 22 emperors celebrated 654 ritualistic ceremonies, worshiping and offering elaborate sacrifices to the God of Heaven. China's Temple of Heaven continues to be the largest and most well-preserved sacrificial building complex in the world today. In terms of its intricate design, breathtaking artistry, and brilliantly conceived composition, 
this magnificent sanctuary stands out as the finest example of religious architecture ever built in China. For centuries, each year the Emperor of China would put aside his normal duties of state and travel to the Temple of Heaven grounds. His objectives were to pray, worship, and offer a series of extravagant sacrifices to the invisible yet all-powerful ruler. It would be difficult to overstate the significance of this somber celebration. It was the most important and elaborate event in ancient Chinese culture. The most powerful man on earth bowed before the supreme ruler of all creation to seek favor and forgiveness and to ask for divine blessings for himself and his people. More than a ritualistic formality, this momentous act of worship, prayer, and sacrifice helped to establish and define the emperor's divine right to rule. He was representing all creatures under the sky in having a personal talk with such a high, mighty, and powerful being. Then he took all the promises from the highest mighty one back to the people. Through his prayers, everything concerning life in that year obtained a guarantee. The ceremonial preparations for the emperor's sacrifice to the God of Heaven began three days prior to the actual ceremony. These preparations included a self-imposed fast by the emperor, where he abstained not only from food, but from a variety of worldly pleasures. When the emperor began his fasting, he had to avoid eating any meat or being with any woman. Through this, he expressed his fear toward heaven because the ancient Chinese thought that the desire for food and lust is human nature, that it didn't please heaven and had to be cleansed away from the people's mind. Just before this day, the emperor should have one week to live the simple life alone. He would take a bath every day, and in the early morning of the midwinter solstice, he should wear the special robe for the sacrificial ceremony. During the emperor's abstinence, preparation for the ceremony was underway. The road to the temple was covered with new sand, and candles were placed for illumination. For the average citizen, all activity stopped. They were to remain closed off in their homes, leaving the streets empty. Five days before the ceremony, the emperor sent princes to inspect the sacrificial calf. This calf, called the dew, had to be flawless, of unmixed color, with each horn the size of a silkworm cocoon or a walnut. A mistake in selecting the calf would result in being beaten 100 times with the staff and sentenced to three years in prison. During those days, this sacrifice ceremony to heaven was elaborate and complicated. Since cows are comparatively bigger than other animals, they are chosen as the burnt offering. These animals are chosen several months before the sacrifice. They have to be pure and with spotless fur. Sometimes white calves were chosen. The ancients thought that a little calf didn't know about reproduction. An innocent creature didn't know about pin and moo, or the difference between male and female. Therefore, it was pure, and offerings to God had to be pure. After leaving the Palace of Abstinence on the morning of the sacrificial ceremony, the emperor was carried in a sedan to the steps of the circular mound altar. Once he arrived, the ceremony of welcoming the Spirit of God would be announced. Establishing his position as a son of heaven, the emperor's role as the nation's sovereign ruler was beyond question. This office, however, also carried with it the responsibility of maintaining favor and good standing with his spiritual father. 
Tien, sometimes called Great Tien, or Shang Di, the God of Heaven. To ensure that goodwill was maintained between Tien and the people of China, each year the emperor carefully followed the mandates of the elaborate ritual in order to offer an acceptable sacrifice to this unseen, omnipotent god. For thousands of years, the only place on earth where this sacrifice could be offered was the Temple of Heaven. The entire Jatian ceremony was broken down into nine separate stages. Beginning with welcoming the heavenly god, which greeted the god Tian as a spirit descended from heaven, the ritual was followed by a series of offerings of jade, silk, wine, and sacrificial calves. Once he arrived, the ceremony of welcoming the Spirit of God would be announced. As the ceremony continued, the specially chosen calf was placed inside the furnace, along with about 50 pounds of special incense as a sacrificial offering to God. The burning carcass and smoldering incense filled the temple area with smoke. Smoke was an important means of worship in ancient Chinese culture. Even the common people burned wood as a means of expressing their devotion to the God of Heaven. Songs of praise and adoration were sung to the God of Heaven as the smoke from the offerings filled the temple and rose to the sky. The words of the song read, I hope the smoke from the fire will transport the offerings to your palace in heaven. All are praising your great name. The heavens, the earth, the plants and animals, the mountains and the rivers, all are present and singing songs of praise to you. The musical prayers written and sung during the Ming Dynasty went on to speak of the God of heaven as creator of all. Of old in the beginning, there was the great chaos without form and dark. In the midst thereof there existed neither form nor sound. Thou, O spiritual sovereign, camest forth in thy presidency, and first didst divided the grosser parts from the purer. Thou madest heaven, thou madest earth, thou madest man. All things with their reproducing power got their being. Similar prayers from other dynasties also reflected on creation. The words read as follows. The sun and moon did not shine, and life did not yet exist. Lo, Sheng Wang appeared, and white differed from black, day from night, and life began to thrive. Behold, heaven and earth and life. In the sun, in order to ensure that the integrity of this unique musical heritage would be passed down from one generation to the next, a special office of sacred music was established, which provided the highest level of training in all of China for these elite performers. Music and dance were extremely important means of expression used throughout the sacrificial ceremony. The consecrated talents of skilled performers were enlisted as a way of offering prayers and expressing worship to the God of Heaven. The harmonious special music conveyed an atmosphere of solemn magnificence and mystery. As the music played, the ceremony petitioner read these words aloud. Now begins the winter solstice when nature begins its hibernation, and while I with my palace attendants prepare these fine silks and other offerings from our people. The ceremonial furnaces burn in anticipation of your coming. Together with our ancestors, may the imperial heavenly ruler enjoy our offerings. Many other songs of prayer were offered during the ceremony, including prayers asking for forgiveness 
and those proclaiming the greatness and purity of the God of heaven. Glory! Once these gifts were offered, the sacrificial table was cleared, and the emperor then knelt once more in submission to the god of creation, the invisible but all-seeing ruler of heaven. Everything had to be as close to perfection as possible. For the emperor, this public and private act of reverence was the single most important event on his yearly calendar. The final stage of this elaborate ritual was the observation of the ceremonial lantern, during which the calves, silks, and incense sticks were consumed in the furnace. When the smoke of the burning offering rose up into the sky, God could sense it. The emperor should stand there, reverent and respectful, watching the smoke curling up into the sky and finally disappearing into the endless blue heaven. The entire ceremony from beginning to end was enacted with intense discipline and meticulous attention to detail. The respect and reverence for Shangdi, the god of heaven, could never be compromised. I would imagine that the Empress' heart should be full of humility and sacredness. After all, this was the most important event in the year. Here, he had faced the only one who was superior to himself. In Chinese, Shangdi is the highest god, that is, no god can be more powerful than him. He is the highest god, and he transcends any other gods, any ancestor gods, any nature gods. The beauty, majesty, and mystery of the Temple of Heaven and the sacrificial ceremonies that were offered here continue to amaze us and to stir our imaginations. China, her emperor, and the God of Heaven meeting together. One emperor ruling one China, worshiping one God, the one true God of Heaven. <laughs> 